Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, today I'm going to read from a book by Alexander McCall Smith, which is part of a series uh, called the 44 Scotland Street series. He's written books about German acad academics. He's written books about uh, number one ladies detective agency in Africa. But now he's come to his hometown, Edinburgh, and he uh, is writing about the various residents of this apartment building, 44 Scotland Street. And in this building dwells a family. Um, the mother is Irene Pollock. Her husband is Stuart. They have a seven-year-old son. At this, in this book, he's seven. It started when he was five, <laughs> uh, the series. And a baby named um, Ulysses. Um, so we're going to start with... Uh, well, I better give you a little bit more of the back story. Irene, who is the mother in the story, entered a contest to um, win a free trip, first class all the way, to Bahrain in the Arab Emirates. She won it by writing a slogan, and the winning slogan was, so much sand close at hand, and she won the contest. So she gets a free first-class trip, and um, through no fault of her own, her outfit is ruined by um, hostess, the attendant, spilling coffee on her. And then she gets the attendant's outfit, and something happens to that. And by the time she gets to the super five-star hotel, the only thing that she can find to wear in the gift shop is a burqa, full burqa. And when she walks out into the lobby, she is mistaken for another person, and she's whisked into a limousine and taken to a desert sheik's harem. And it takes a long time before she gets out because she starts a book club in the harem. And it was the first time in this entire sheik's harem that the women didn't complain all the time. So now he doesn't want to let her go because now she's got a book club for the ladies and they're happy. But finally, the British government gets her out. She comes home. And now she wants to know what happened in her absence. So. Uh, now, I may substitute some American words for some of the Scottish words, so I took the liberty of that. But the word inquisition, we all understand. So here's the beginning of the inquisition. Bertie Pollock, seven years old, the son of Stuart and Irene Pollock, and brother of Ulysses, um, one-year-old, was sitting on the floor attempting to complete a jigsaw puzzle. The picture in the puzzle was a distant view of Stirling Castle, with the curious tower of the Wallace Monument in the background. Unfortunately for Bertie, there were several jigsaw pieces missing, including half of the Wallace Monument and several important parts of the ca uh, castle's defenses. Irene was browsing through various magazines that had arrived dur her, during her recent prolonged absence in the Middle East, where, owing to a misunderstanding with the Bedouin sheik and his staff, she had been sequestered for months in a remote desert harem. Now, back in Edinburgh, remarkably unaffected by her experience, durance it may have been, but hardly vile, she was busy catching up with things that had happened while she was away. I'm not going to be able to finish this puzzle, Mummy, said Bertie from his position on the floor. There are 10 really important pieces missing. I've counted them. 10, said Irene. You should take more care of these things. You really should. 
If we all lost our jigsaw puzzles pieces, then nobody would be able to complete a puzzle, would they, Bertissimo? By the way, she has been giving him Italian lessons since he was five. Bertie smarted under the injustice of the accusation. But it wasn't me, he protested. It was Ulysses. He ate them. I saw him spit some of them out, all chewed up. I saw it, Mummy. And that piece over there, the top of the Wallace Monument, he swallowed it. I saw him do it. Irene glanced at Stuart, who was sitting on the other side of the room, tapping an email into his laptop computer. Oh, really, said Irene, becoming severe. You shouldn't have let your brother swallow things, Bertie. We're old enough to prevent such things, aren't we? Seven is old enough to take on responsibilities like that. But I wasn't looking after him, said Bertie. Daddy was. Stuart looked up from his computer but said nothing. Stuart, said Irene, her voice quiet enough, but now carrying a note of menace. Bertie says that Ulysses ate the Wallace Monument. Surely you must have noticed. Stuart looked evasive. He's always putting things in his mouth. It's difficult sometimes. I don't know why he does it. Irene put down her magazine. It's perfectly normal, Stuart. Oral gratification. She spoke patiently, as if explaining something simple to one who might nonetheless not quite grasp it. And during that stage, we must be especially vigilant. It was a reproof. Stuart was in no doubt about it, but he had learned not to argue with Irene. What was the point? Resistance, he felt, often just made matters worse. Granny stuck a dummy in his mouth, said Bertie. That stopped his chewing. It also stopped him swallowing things. Irene bristled. A dummy? Stuart glanced at Bertie as if to warn him, but it was too late. Do I understand correctly, she said, glaring at Stuart, that your mother put a dummy in Ulysses' mouth? I think you've guessed the dummy is a pacifier, right? It was Bertie who answered, eager to protect his father. He brought up something he had heard at school from Pansy, whose mother was American. You know what they call those things in America? They call them pacifiers. He felt increasingly concerned for his father. Irene was now glaring at Stuart. I read that the German word for dummy is schnuller, mummy. Did you know that? That's because this did not distract his mother. Stuart, she said ominously. Bertie persisted. And he really loved it. Babies like dummies, mommy. Pansy's little sister used one until she was five. Irene ignored this. Stuart, she said, I thought I had made our policy crystal clear. No dummies. Stuart fixed his eyes on his computer screen. Stuart, hissed Irene, we need to talk in the kitchen. Sensing the danger his father was in, Bertie suggested his parents could talk where they were. And then he added, it was my fault, Mummy. I told her he wanted one. But Irene was already on her feet, signaling to Stuart. Bertie sighed and returned to his puzzle. The Wallace Monument looked odd enough, he thought, even when complete without its crown spire and top section. It looked even odder, rather like an overgrown grain elevator. He wondered whether he could draw a substitute piece or perhaps cut a um, picture out of a brochure and repair the puzzle that way. Ulysses was all right as a brother, he thought, but he had no respect for other people's property. This worried Bertie, as he was a prodigious reader and had read recently something about psychopaths. 
The article had said nothing about baby psychopaths, but presumably they existed, as adult psychopaths must have been babies at some stage. If Ulysses was a psychopath, as seemed likely to him, then Bertie felt he was in for a difficult few years, having to protect his property against the depredations of a younger, psychopathic sibling. Perhaps he could be kept locked in his room, thought Bertie. He could be let out for meals and for short expeditions to Valvona and Crolla, chained to his pushchair if necessary, but for the most part he would have to be kept uh, confined. He would be kind to him, of course, and pass on his older toys, but it seemed to him that community safety should come first. Behind the closed door of the kitchen, Irene confronted Stuart in a lowered but chilling tone. Your mother, Stuart, she began. He swallowed. His mother had provided a lifeline. Was very helpful, he interjected. She came to our rescue. How could I have looked, over, looked after Bertie and Ulysses and gone to work? She saved the day. I'm not denying she helped, said Irene, but you could have found somebody local. There are plenty of local girls looking for this sort of job. The way that Irene said local girls irritated Stuart. There was an ocean of condescension, he felt, in those two words. Local girls, he began, by that I take it you mean proletarian. Oh, don't be ridiculous, Stuart. You know my political views. I identify with the proletariat. Stuart's eyes widened. Irene had been brought up in Moray Place. Whatever that was, by no stretch of the imagination, was it proletarian. From uh, somewhere like Muir House, Stuart persisted, is that what you meant? Irene's voice turned into a hiss. Don't try to obscure the issue, Stuart. The point is that your mother clearly has all the wrong ideas about child rearing, just as I expected. She raised me, said Stuart. Let's not go there, said Irene. And she was a very good mother, continued Stuart. Dummies, exploded Irene. Dummies are a way of shutting the child up, of distracting her from engagement with the world. You may as well plug the child into the television set. She paused. I take it she didn't allow the boys to watch television. Stuart was silent. Next chapter, Irene on popular culture. Well, Stuart, challenged Irene, did she or did she not? Stuart looked out of the window. On the other side of the street, the impassive windows of Scotland Street, beautiful in the regularity of classical Georgian architecture, offered no help to one in a corner as he was. The sky, though, did. It was high and clear, a pale blue patch of hope above the roofs of the tenements. It reminded him that what he suffered down below was just that, suffering down below. Irene repeated her challenge. Did Bertie and Ulysses watch television in my absence? It's a simple question, Stuart one to which an unadorned yes or no will be sufficient answer. Stewart worked for the Scottish government, and this involved close contact with politicians. He knew that there were ways of avoiding a yes or no question. Some politicians were masterly at executing such sidesteps, but as he withered under Irene's forensic gaze, he found it difficult to remember how they did it. But from somewhere deep in his mind, 
the appropriate answer surfaced. They were given a great deal of intellectual stimulation, he said. My mother was, Irene cut him short. I'm asking a very simple question, Stuart, and I assume by your refusal to respond that the answer must be yes, they did. I didn't say that, said Stuart. Did you hear me say yes? You did not. Irene's nostrils flared. There are more than one ways of there are more than one way of saying yes. Nonverbal communication, Stuart. You should be aware of that. Stuart tried another tack. There's a great deal of evidence that forbidding children to do things simply means that the forbidden thing becomes more attractive to them. If he had imagined that this might mollify his wife, he was wrong. Oh, yes, she crowed. And where exactly is this evidence? Chapter and verse, Stuart. You quote evidence to me without giving the source. You're always doing it. Irene inched forward. Oh, I am, am I? And you are now pre presuming to teach me about infant psychology. Stuart, are you suddenly the big expert in a subject you've never studied? Or does being a statistician make you a psychologist too? Perhaps I'm missing something here. Stuart sighed. I don't want to argue with you, he said. Good. Well, let's look at the damage. What did they watch? I wasn't always there. This did not satisfy Irene. Well, did Bertie tell you? He might have. He might have? What exactly does that mean? Stuart realized that it was a lost cause. I think they watched some discs she had of pre-recorded television shows. There was something called Andy Pandy. It's a classic, I believe, very old-fashioned. That was the wrong term to use. Old-fashioned, Irene burst out. It's out of the arc, Stuart. Look at the gender roles. Luby Lou is subservient. Andy is the initiator of the little schemes. It's atrocious, Stuart. Stuart gazed out of the window. He had always thought Andy Pandy rather appealing in an innocent sort of way. He decided on full disclosure. If Irene were to find out later that he had not told the whole truth, the situation could become far worse. They also watched a film, I think, I believe, something historical. The steely tone returned. Oh, yes, and what was that? I know I'm only their mother, but I feel I have a right to know what films my children are watching. Something to do with Scottish history. Irene's eyes narrowed. What exactly? Stuart had no further room to wriggle. Brave heart, I believe. For a moment, Irene said nothing. Then when she spoke, her voice was thin. Each chiseled word falling from her lips like a sliver of ice. Your mother allowed them to watch Braveheart? That, that travesty? That meretricious two hours of nonsense? That catalog of tribal violence? We'll have Bertie painting a saltier on his face next. He sought in vain to defend the film. I don't know if it's that bad, he said. The essential story is there. William Wallace, he remembered that Ulysses had eaten the Wallace Monument and that he had been blamed for that, too. And he thought, what would Braveheart himself have done had he been obliged to deal with a hectoring wife like Irene? He would have chopped her head off, probably, with his claymore or whatever it was that the Scots wielded 
with such enthusiasm before they all became new men. That would have stopped Mrs. Braveheart's nagging. Irene interrupted his reverie. Any other films? The Cruel Sea. We all watched that one together. My mother has always loved that film. She likes Jack Hawkins, you see. Jack Hawkins? Stuart threw caution to the winds. And The Jungle Book. Bertie loved that. He liked Sherry Khan. This was too much for Irene. Now raising her voice almost to a scream, she gave Stuart her views on Jungle Book. Do you realize, Stuart, that the Jungle Book is by Rudyard Kipling, Kipling, the arch imperialist? Why not throw John Buchanan into the mix while you're about it? You might as well let Bertie watch The 39 Steps. Well, actually, they had watched The 39 Steps and enjoyed it immensely, even if Ulysses had been sick three or four times during the film. Not only is The Jungle Book by Kipling, but it is also by way of Walt Disney. Irene paused to let the name sink in. Walt Disney, Stuart. Stuart thought the children rather enjoyed Disney films, but did not think it wise to point this out. In the last desperate move, he threw in Mary Poppins. Bertie loved Julie Andrews as Mary Poppins, he said. Irene looked at him with scorn. Flying nursemaids? Chimney sweeps with very bad attempts at English accents? It sounds as if you've watched it yourself, said Stuart. There was a silence, and Stuart realized he had overstepped the mark. Only joking, he said. I imagine you read about it in The Guardian. Irene shook her head. I'm very disappointed in you, Stuart, she said. When you consider how much time we've invested in the Bertie project, when you think of the efforts I've put in to protect him from the baneful effects of popular culture, an uphill battle that has to be fought every inch of the way, Stuart, and that mother of yours goes and destroys the whole thing with a flood, a positive flood, of cinematic rubbish, I despair. I really do. Stuart transferred his gaze from the window to the floor. I suggest we just forget about the whole thing, he said. You're back now. That's all that counts. Irene pursed her lips. We'll see. These ideas, you know, are insidious. This dross is addictive. It's like sugar. Give children a taste of sugar, and they clamor for more. Stuart nodded miserably. If you say so, he muttered. I do, said Irene. A sighting at the museum. The entrance hall of the Royal Museum of Scotland was thronged with visitors, including a number of groups of children, all chattering excitedly, all being marshaled for a walk around the exhibits by tense-looking teachers and their helpers. That morning, the Steiner School had sent Bertie's class for a visit, and so it was that Bertie, Tofu, Olive, Pansy, Hiawatha, Larch, and several others were being led up the staircase to the atrium. Now, boys and girls, said the teacher, Miss Campbell, we're about to embark on a little voyage of discovery. We are about to take a walk round Scotland's past amongst lots of other things. Isn't that interesting? Not really, muttered Tofu. All the stuff here is old, really tired stuff. Did you say something, Tofu? asked Miss Campbell. 
Not me, Miss Campbell, said Tofu. Because I can't imagine, the teacher said, that you would be so silly as to say that museums are full of things that are old and tired. Tofu was adept at speaking without moving his lips. And now he said, sotto voce, just like you. Bertie felt he had to respond. Tofu, he whispered, you shouldn't say that teachers are old and tired, even if they are. That's really unkind. Olive, standing not far away, gasped, Miss Campbell, she blurted out, did you hear that? Bertie said that teachers are old and tired. I heard him. Bertie defended himself. I didn't, he wailed. I didn't say that, Olive. And to Miss Campbell, he said, I promise you, Miss Campbell, I promise you, I didn't say you were old and tired. I'm sure you didn't, Bertie, said Miss Campbell, glancing discouragingly at Olive. And anyway, we haven't come here to argue about who said what. We've come here to explore this fascinating world we live in. That settled, the group continued its progress up the stairs and into the 19th century hall of the museum, a great white cathedral, cathedral of light. High above them, a vast glass roof was a window unto a whole slice of the sky, allowing the morning light to fill the hall below with brilliance. Behind the walkways that clung to the walls of this hall, the museum's galleries stretched invitingly. Science, the natural world, clothing, whales, rockets, pat pots and pans, medicine, heat, electricity. Awed by the sheer size of the hall, the children listened to the teacher's plan. They would visit natural history first, then science, before seeing the display of Scottish history. In the science section, Miss Campbell pointed out a small glass inhaler, the product of Stevenson Scientific Instruments firm. This was for chloroform, she announced. You see that bit there? That was put over the patient's mouth so they could breathe in the chloroform. The children peered through the glass. And does anybody know what chloroform was? Asked Miss Campbell. Bertie looked about him. He knew, but was aware too, that one had to be careful about displaying knowledge in the presence of people like to Tofu and Larch, who as far as he could tell, knew very little and resented anything that revealed their comparative ignorance. Miss Campbell was looking in his direction. I'm sure you know, Bertie, she said. In fact, I think you have the look of one who knows what chloroform was all about. He didn't say he knew, muttered Tofu. No, he didn't, agreed Larch. Bertie doesn't know everything. Do you, Bertie? The look that Larch shot in his direction persuaded Bertie that he had been right not to disclose his knowledge. But now Miss Campbell was waiting for his answer, and he could not tell a lie. I sort of know, he said, hoping that his ambiguous answer might deflect hostility. But Larch was staring at him, almost sneering, and he knew his strategy had not worked. He sighed. It puts people to sleep. Exactly, said Miss Campbell. Well done, Bertie. And do you know who invented it right here in Edinburgh? Do we know his name? This was the signal for Tofu's suggestion of a well-known Scottish politician, generally known to put people to sleep while talking to them. No, Tofu, said Miss Campbell, not him. 
She turned to Bertie. Well, Bertie? It was Mr. Simpson, said Bertie. Well done again, Bertie, said Miss Campbell. Yes, it was James Young Simpson. He had dinner parties in Queen Street where he showed his friends how it worked. They all sat around the table, table <clears throat> and breathed in chloroform. It put them to sleep. Larch nodded. My mom and dad have dinner parties like that. They sit at the table and sniff. Miss Campbell cut him off. That's enough, Larch. That's different, said Tofu. They're not sniffing, sniffing chloroform. They're, Miss Campbell raised her voice. I said that was quite enough, Tofu. Olive now chimed in. My father says that Larch's parents are a disgrace, Miss Campbell. He says he knows all about them. Shut your face, olive oil, snapped Larch. Hush, said Miss Campbell. I will not have language like that, Larch. You apologize to Olive. For what? asked Larch. For telling her to shut her face, intervened Pansy. Look, Miss Campbell, look how upset Olive is. Larch made a grudging apology, received in stony silence by Olive. Dr. Simpson was a very brave man, said Miss Campbell, eager to revert to history. It's called self-experimentation, and that means that rather than experiment, experimenting on other people, he used himself. That's very brave. And of course, it meant that people could have operations without feeling any pain. That made a big difference, as I'm sure you can imagine. She paused. And now, boys and girls, I think we can make our way to the Scottish history section, where we shall see how the people lived a long time ago when Scotland was a very different place from what it is today. They moved off, following the teacher in pairs, and it was while they were making their way down the stairs that led to the Scottish galleries that Olive suddenly stopped, stared across the hall, and gave Bertie a nudge. Isn't that your dad, Bertie? She said. Bertie looked in the direction in which Olive was now pointing. I don't think my dad's here, he said. He goes to the office during the day. Olive persisted. But it is him, Bertie. Look, he's over there. Bertie looked again. Olive had been pointing in the direction of the museum cafe with its open expanse of tables and chairs. The cafe, a popular drop-in place, was busy and Bertie had difficulty in making out the man whom Olive was talking about. But then he did, and it was his father. He could tell that now. And who's the woman he's with, Bertie? asked Olive. That's not your mummy, is it? No, I don't think it is, Bertie. So who is it? Next chapter. The Intimacy of Tents. Stuart was late home that evening, but was just in time to read Bertie his bedtime story, which currently was Robert Louis Stevenson's Kidnapped, substituted by Stuart for Irene's proposal of the young Gandhi, an entirely worthy but rather slow book on the early life of the Mahatma. There would be time enough, Stuart thought, for Bertie to learn about Gandhi. For the moment, he would find more pleasure in the travails of David Balfour and his experiences in the Hebrides and the Highlands. Ulysses, of course, was already asleep. In spite of his gastric issues, he tended to be sick whenever Irene picked him up. When it came to matters of day-to-day -day routine, he had proved to be a very easy baby, sleeping through the night from the age of four months onward and awakening pro promptly at seven each morning. 
This regularity had been of great assistance to Irene, who was never at her best in the early morning, and greatly appreciated the extra hour or two of sleep that this routine afforded her. Stuart, by contrast, was a late sleeper, I'm sorry, was a light sleeper, and there were few nights during which he did not wake in the small hours, sometimes lying in the darkness for an hour or more before sleep returned. Had Ulysses required feeding or changing during the night, he would have been the obvious person to take that on and would, as it happened, have enjoyed the distraction. He had done that when Bertie was an infant and had never minded sitting there in the room they used as a nursery, his tiny son in his arms, watching the level of milky baby formula in the bottle slowly dropping as Bertie sucked his way through his untimely early breakfast. There was so much that he wanted to say to this tiny bundle of humanity, his son, and he often did so, talking to him as one might talk to an old friend confiding much that he felt he could say to nobody else, indifferent to Bertie's uncomprehending gaze. For Stuart, like many men, was lonely. He had long since stopped being able to say much to Irene. His conversation with her had become progressively more one-sided. Any response he made to her observations was never really listened to, nor given much weight on the rare occasions that it was. He was not entirely without friends. He had kept in touch with some contemporaries from James Gillespie's, where he had spent his high school years, and they occasionally met at the golf tavern on the edge of the meadows. But those reunion evenings had proved to be increasingly difficult for him. These friends, all of whom were, like him, married, seemed to be happy in their marriages, or, if they were not, were adept at concealing their unhappiness. They spoke of a holiday plans with real enthusiasm. They were going with their families to Spain or Portugal or wherever it was and seemed to be eagerly anticipating the trip. One of them, Tom, who had been perhaps Stuart's closest friend at Gillespie's and who was now a successful insurance broker, had told him of a planned trip to Iceland later that summer and confessed that what really excited him about the trip was not the prospect of the dips in geothermally heated pools or marveling at geysers, but the prospect of camping for two whole weeks with his wife. Frankly, Tom said, I can't wait. I'd love to go to Iceland, said Stuart. Yes, but what I'm really looking forward to, Stuart, is two weeks in the tent with Alice. Two weeks. Stuart had looked at him with incomprehension, not sure whether he had understood correctly. Was it the case that Tom liked the idea of being under canvas for two weeks? There were, of course, some people who liked tents. Or was he looking forward to being in a tent for two weeks with a particular person, his wife? If it were the former, then Stuart would simply marvel at the different things that people liked. There were some people who sought pleasure that no rational person, in Stuart's view, would espouse. There were people to whom bungee jumping appealed. There were people who liked four spoons of sugar in their tea. There were people who were never happier than when standing on a dance floor listening to music so loud that their eardrums, or what remained of their eardrums, hurt. And there were people who liked sleeping in uncomfortable, constricting sleeping bags, not infrequently made out of some sort of nylon, under a canvas roof that could not be trusted to keep the rain out entirely, who liked communal ablution blocks shared with total strangers, with showers that dribbled lukewarm water, who liked the feeling of being not quite clean 
a target for midges and mosquitoes and un other unidentifiable agents of itchiness. There were people who liked all that, and Tom may have been one of them. Or, and this was slightly embarrassing, it was possible that Tom liked the idea of being in a tent with Alice for that length of time. Stuart could imagine that there would be people with whom being in a tent would be an adventure. A newly found lover, for example, with whom such intimacy was novel. He could understand the attraction of that. But Tom and Alice had been married for years and presumably lived in close proximity. Was, Newing, was their Newington flat perhaps too unromantic to inspire excitement? That was possible, he supposed, but he had found his friend's confession an awkward one and had changed the subject by starting to talk about Iceland's ge geological... I'm going to kill this author. Too many syllables. Iceland's geological instability, a topic that, as it happened, was one on which Tom had views. They've been very clever, these Icelanders, his friend said. Few of their houses are anywhere where they could really be damaged if anything blows up. Humanity, in general, had a habit of building its house in the wrong place, don't you think? Stuart had not given Tom's observation the thought it deserved. His mind had gone back to tense, and he was asking himself how he would feel about spending two weeks under canvas with Irene, whether in Iceland or in a more geologically stable part of the world. And he had come to the conclusion that he would not enjoy it, that two weeks in such circumstances would be a sentence to be served with as much forbearance as he could muster. This realization then prompted another, even more disturbing question. If he could not face spending two weeks in a tent with Irene, then was there anybody with whom he would like to do just that? There was. The next chapter is Spitfire's Courage Statistics. Bertie looked up at his father from beneath the blankets, perched on the side of his son's bed, Stuart, Stuart had a tattered edition of Kidnapped in his hands. Yes. I can't hear you. You should finish. Okay. And he was reading the book aloud, pausing here and there for dramatic emphasis. Bertie's eyes widened with excitement at Stevenson's tale to think that such events took place outside Edinburgh and such a short time ago, too. And that's as far as I can get. I'm sorry for this stumbling, but a lot of, a lot of syllables, you know. <laughs>